If you got your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 20. We, uh, last week we looked when Jesus uh, appeared there in the room and, and spoke to his disciples and what he did and all the, the things that were in that, incredible things. I don't think this week is going to be any different. There's some amazing, for me, there's some amazing things to see here and to talk about in these next few verses. And uh, beginning in verse 24, if you're there. John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So we had all this information about the disciples and, and what happened there and what Jesus did and all that incredible scene, you know, as they watched him eat and as they got their senses all about him and realized this is really a real person and he really was dead and he really is right here in front of us. So they got all that done. But Thomas wasn't there. He was one of the 11 that were left. And we don't know why. We don't, we don't you know, uh, you, I read some commentators, they didn't treat Thomas too good. They said, you know, he, he shouldn't have missed the service, you know, that kind of deal. And, you know, I got where they were coming from, but I, I thought they were missing the mark on that one. Who knows why he wasn't there, but he wasn't there. It's so good for us that he wasn't there. Because God could teach us something from, from all this. When I mention Thomas, when I say Thomas, you say, <laughs> we didn't have to practice that, did we? I say Thomas, you say, there you go. Because can you imagine almost 2,000 years later and he still gets doubting Thomas? Oh, my dear. We, uh, maybe we've done him a disservice. Maybe it really shouldn't be quite that way. We're going to look at it and, and find out maybe a little bit more of what maybe we should think. But let's see who Thomas was, because really Thomas was mentioned more than some of the disciples. He, he wasn't below average. He was above average as far as mentioned in the Bible. And he's got some neat places here. Look at this here in, in John. Right here, John, <laughs> chapter 11, verse 7. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? Lately, they were going to, what, what are they talking about? They were staying away from Judea because they had been threatened. Now Lazarus is sick. And Jesus is saying, let's go. And they're saying, oh, you don't want to go. Haven't they been saying they're going to kill you? They want to stone you? And then just go down to verse 14. Go down to verse 14. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That is a moment that John remembered and put it in the gospel. That it was Thomas who said, guys, if he's going to die, let's go die with him. So, so he was no scaredy cat. I don't think he missed the meeting because he was afraid to go outside. I, we don't know why he missed, but, but he has some courage here. So much that John remembered it was Thomas who said, let's go die with him. And they all went in to where Lazarus was, not knowing what their fate was going to be. Of course, they were going to have a little bit more courage after they saw him raise up Lazarus from the dead. You know, you, you think about it. They saw him walk on water. They saw him feed 10,000. Now he's raising up the dead. They're starting to get confident. <laughs> We know we're wise and we stay away from dangerous places. We ought to all learn wisdom from that. Don't go into dangerous places unless God really tells you to. Jesus himself didn't go in dangerous places unless his father told him to. But, but here Thomas saw that. And then a little farther in uh, John 14, this happens. This is where you know, Jesus was saying, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. But Jesus ends that statement with this. Then Jesus said to them, oh, no, go, go to the next one, 14. And where uh, I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? 
I'm so glad Thomas asked that question. You know, he was the one that spoke up and says, but we're not sure where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, how are we going to know the way? And we got this incredible quote that most every believer in Jesus knows. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to know the way? It's Jesus. It's a person. It, you want to walk in that way? Then walk after Jesus. Find Jesus. What is it we say here? We are, you know, people say well, you're crossroad. Yes, we are, not crossroads. We're not... Our emphasis is not the place of decision, even though we try to end every service with a place of decision. But our name implies it is, a, it is the road of the cross. Anybody know what the road of the cross is? If anyone's going to follow after me, let them deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me. You want to know the way? The way is Jesus the way, you know, when we study the Gospels, what are we studying? How we're to live. He said, the things I do, you shall do also. So when we study the Gospels, we're looking at how we should live, how we should be. Jesus is how, how he loved is how we should love. How he cared is how we should care. How he was faithful to his father is how we should be faithful to Jesus. So you want to know the way? It's pursuing after Jesus. It's not having a beginning a point. It's having a journey point. And the journey is Jesus. The journey is knowing him, fellowshipping with him, discovering who he is, and learning by the power of the Holy Spirit to be just like him. In this world, in this life, in this place. And we have that because Thomas asked a question. Aren't you glad for Thomas? I am the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father except through me. That was an answer to Thomas's question. So let's look here. Verse 25. The other disciples therefore said, now Thomas wasn't there. Everybody else was. <laughs> Who was everybody else? <laughs> the disciples were there. All that were left, the ten. Uh, the Bible says the two people that went on the road to Emmaus, after they got done, they said, we must go back and tell them. And they went to tell them and say, hey, we saw Jesus. And it says, oh, yes, the women did too. And so did Peter. And so did Mary, according to John, had her own personal visit. And, and so you got the, the, the people on the road to Emmaus. You got all 10 of the disciples and whoever else. And you had all, who knows the number of women that, that saw him. Mary herself saw him. So this is all the people that saw him. And then verse 25 says, The other disciples therefore said to him, to Thomas, We have seen the Lord. And, and, and the word there in said is, is implying in the Greek that it was many times. Which I get it. You know, there's ten disciples, many women and Mary and all. And they all just kept telling Thomas of what they had seen. So it's like, Hey, hey, Thomas, I saw Jesus. We saw him. It was this way. Oh, yeah, we saw him at the tomb. Oh, yeah, I had a personal visit. I thought he was the gardener. Oh, yeah, we were walking down the road to Emmaus. And, and when he blessed, blessed the bread, we saw it was Jesus. And it was awesome, Thomas. And, and then somebody else said, yeah, let me tell you my side of it. And how I said, let me tell you the view I got. And we watched him eat, eat fish and, and honeycomb. And it was awesome, Thomas. And Thomas is going, who am I? Chop liver. <laughs> he heard it and he heard it again. And I have to think after a while, he had to start inside going, but I was there. I was faithful. I, I was willing to die for him. I did. How come everybody, how come everybody's had an experience, but me? You, you, you say he came in and he said, look, look at my hands and my feet. He said, look at my side. And he talked to you on the road and you said your hearts burned within you. And, and then he broke bread with you. And, and then he vanished right in front of your eyes. How come everybody has a visitation but me? 
Here's the danger. Remember, the road of the cross is what? Deny yourself. But when life becomes all about you, Why did you have the experience and I didn't? Why did you see Jesus and I didn't? Why did you get to walk with him on the road to a man? I was doing stuff too. You know, maybe I wasn't with you. Maybe I wasn't on the road, but I was where I was. How come Jesus didn't come to me? And when you start making your life about you and not about him, you start changing your direction. And you start saying things like, well, unless I see his hands and unless I, you notice what I'm saying? I'm adding a few eyes in the scripture here for <laughs> emphasis. Unless I put my finger in the print like you guys did, unless I see those pierced feet, unless I thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. See, we call him doubting Thomas. Jesus calls him unbelieving Thomas. A skeptic you can deal with. A skeptic is open. But, but an unbeliever has shut himself off. So think about it. Thomas puts his own self in his position based on his wants and his, what he thought was his needs. And he ends up giving demands on Jesus. Jesus, I'm not going to believe unless you do it this way. I'm not going to believe unless I touch, you know, and so what happens? We're going to see a, a separation of days and Thomas is going to be stuck in a rut for eight days. Eight days he's going to be stuck in a rut because of unbelief. Eight days because of self. Everybody else, is, I, I bet you everybody else, they're talking, sharing. Don't tell him he's all upset. <laughs> but they're talking to one another and they're searching maybe scriptures. Maybe they're talking over things. Maybe that sermon that Peter's going to give is already starting to build because now it's all starting to make sense. Remember when Jesus was there, they got the spirit to understand the scriptures. And I think they're talking about what they've been comprehending. And who's out of it? He doesn't even believe. Because it's, it's got to be his way, his experience. How much of us? You know, Lord, I'll serve you if you do something big for me. I'll serve you. You know, I heard some brother said Jesus showed up in the room with him. I'll, I'll serve you if you shock me like that, Lord. How many times have we said, we'll be a better Christian, we'll be a better disciple, we'll, we'll be a better follower, we'll carry that cross better if you'll just do some kind of neat thing for me. Boy, I got quiet in here. <laughs> some of you, I think you remember what you said. <laughs> See, that puts you where Thomas was. I'll serve you. If you do something for me, for my flesh. And Thomas is going to hold back believing. Based on he's coveting what they had. He's upset at Jesus for not coming to him. And he can't shut his emotions off. They're so happy. And why am I left out? And it made him come out with this statement of unbelief. He began to put himself on dangerous ground. Doubt says, I cannot believe it, but unbelief says, I will not believe it. That's why a doubting Thomas was different than an unbelieving Thomas. Thomas, the unbelieving Thomas said, I won't believe it unless Jesus does for me what he did for you. 20, verse 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. 
So once again, he comes behind locked doors. He doesn't need anybody to open them for him. He comes in, and what does he have? He has a, a genuine, real body. <laughs> he has a body just like us. You can touch it. You can feel it. it is, it's the real deal. But yet it's totally different. Our bodies can die. His body can't die anymore. Our bodies would get hurt trying to get in that locked door. He comes right in with that. He's not limited anymore by time, by space, by, by the natural. Uh, now uh, he can break bread and just vanish, just vanish. Because he, because he disappeared? No, he's just in his dimension, not ours. And... But yet it's a genuine body. They saw him. It's there. It, it, it ate uh, fish and honey. Aren't you glad? It ate fish and honeycomb. That means when you get a body like that, you're going to eat. <laughs> We're going to eat, man. I, I, I hope to have crabs. <laughs> Remember the best crab you've ever had? Heaven's going to be better. <laughs> People arguing over what's the best crab. Well, just wait till you get to heaven. It'll be all right there. We're going to have something. It talks about eating in the word and we're going to eat something. And I, I know it's good. Has had a brother come up and say, what about music there? Are you going to play music there? I said, I don't know, but it's going to be a higher dimension than this. See, whatever you think is the best music here, that's going to be even better. I remember a brother who wrote a book because he had had an experience and he said he couldn't describe the music. He said he asked Jesus, what's different about the music? And, and he said Jesus' response was, no time. You know, everything we do is based on time. Well, what would music be like in eternity? What would music be without time? I don't know. So if I am a musician, it's going to be better than I'm doing now. It's going to be in a higher dimension than we do now. It's going to be better. So he says, peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. So what's Jesus trying to correct? This has been eight days now. For eight days he's been brooding and apparently Jesus doesn't think he's changed. For eight days he's been offended. For eight days he says, I won't believe unless I see and have the experience that you've had. So the other disciples have advanced and he has stayed right where he was. Probably even regressed. While he is saying, I'm not going to celebrate. I'm not going to do it. And, I mean, these are people he was with three and a half years. He should have been able to trust them. If he, if he wasn't unsure, some of them, he should have been able to trust Peter, James, and John, right? And he's still in this spot. And Jesus appears in the room, says, peace to you, and then goes, Thomas. And directs his answer to Thomas. Thomas, here's my hands. Here's my feet. Here's my side. Reach your hand in. Now think about this. When Thomas said, when Thomas said, unless I see the handprints, unless I put my fingers in to that, unless I see the feet, unless I see his side and thrust my hand, I will not believe. Did he think Jesus was there? No. Because if Jesus was there, would he have said any of it? He didn't think Jesus was there. But eight days later, Jesus shows up, says peace to all of you, and then quickly goes to Thomas and said, Thomas, now, here you go. Stretch, there he goes. Stretch forth your hand. Put the finger in here. Thrust your hand in the side. Stop being unbelieving, but be believing. He heard every word. Why? Did he get some email? Let me tell you what Thomas said. 
No, he didn't need an email. He heard it. Folks, understand this. That's the realm we deal with now. If you think you're okay because Jesus isn't in the room. Steve, I needed Jesus. Come on, be a Jesus with me here. Doesn't he look like a Jesus? <laughs> no, now he's Jesus. Here he is. He's flesh on the outside. He's with me. So now that he's with me, do, do I, do, you know, how am I going to live now, right now? Because he's with me. Am I going to say, hey, come on, Jesus. Let me go to where the computer is so I can go somewhere I shouldn't be going. <laughs> am I going to do that with him? No, I won't. matter of fact, I won't even think about doing it. Right? Because here he is. I would never do that. Matter of fact, if you had Pastor Rick with you, you probably wouldn't do it. Mm -mm. You don't even have to have Jesus. Just Pastor Rick. <laughs> don't even have to have Pastor Rick. Just have Sister So-and-So. You know, Brother So-and-So. And you won't do it. Do you understand? Jesus is higher than this. He's greater than this now. Because now everywhere you go, he's with everything Thomas said when he wasn't visible. Jesus heard every word and knew every word. That's where we are today. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> That's where we are today. That's the Jesus we know now. He literally says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. If any two are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst and. He's here today. He's looking at hearts. He wants to know, are you looking for him? Or are you pushing him off? Is your heart opening up or is it closing down? Because it makes a difference. And, it, and he loved Thomas. And he came to Thomas and offered him another thing of relationship. He said, Thomas, that's what you asked for here. I'll do it. Aren't you glad he loved him enough? You know, and, and he did it. Instead of saying, how dare you not believe? Instead, he said, here it is. Here's the hands and all that. And then he, then he told him what he really needed to hear. Stop being unbelieving and start believing. You see, because if you're not believing, then you're not living the life. He was shut down, not living the life anymore. And if he stayed in that condition, it would be detrimental to his eternity. And he will come to you today. <laughs> He'll speak to your heart and say, stop being unbelieving and start being believing. You see, if we truly believe, you know, it's not about head ascent. It is about life. If I truly believe, then I live the life. And what is the life? Deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow him. So I'm living the life of, uh, you know, if somebody receives the Lord today, you have just said, it's not about me anymore. It's about him. And everybody ought to be able to see it. Faith is not some abstract idea. The Bible says faith is the substance. Is substance seeable? Can you see substance? Yes, you can. It's like, I see this chair right here. It's got substance and it's here. It's right there. Because it has substance, I know it's there. When we have faith in God, it's people can see it. It's really there. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The hope is, is, is the future. Uh, uh, Jesus has promised us a future. I say I have it. I say I have eternal life. I say I'm going to a wedding. There's going to be a wedding day. Why? Because he promised me. And I live differently because I absolutely believe it. If I don't believe it, you won't see me live differently. And if I don't live differently, then I'm unbelieving. Come on, church, are you hearing me? Therefore, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And I have this hope in the future in what he's promised. It is a sure hope because he said it and he doesn't lie like us. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence. Anybody ever seen invisible evidence? No. Evidence is visible. And it's evidence of something that you can't see. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when you are believing, when you are in the faith, you literally are a walking billboard for Jesus. You're living the life. That's why faith without is dead. Because how can you have a faith that isn't looking like Jesus? He said, the works I do, you shall do also. The, how I'm doing it is how you're going to do it. Why? Because I go to the Father. I'm going to send forth the Spirit. And then you can start living like I live. So to see Jesus, to have relationship with Jesus, to believe in Jesus, to have faith in Jesus, is to live the life, not, not be hidden away. Amen. So. He says to Thomas. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Beware, brethren. So who's he talking to? Christians, that's right. He, he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking about people that believe. Beware, brethren, lest any of who? You. So he's talking to us, and we should beware. Lest what? If any of us, what are we going to do? Have an evil heart of unbelief. What does unbelief do? It doesn't draw you into God. It pulls you away from. If, if I say I'm believing, then I'm drawing to. He said, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And all the effects of being near to Jesus start to happen in your life. But if I'm unbelieving, then I'm obviously not drawing near to him. I am pulling away. So what is the evil of an unbelieving heart? It departs from God. Come on, church. Are you with me? Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another every now and then. Is that what it says? It says daily, every day, every day. Why did you come to church today? Why did you come to church? The Bible says when you come to church, you should build up, encourage, and edify one another. What is it saying? It's also matching up to this, that we are exhorting one another when we're here. What are we exhorting each one for? That we would not fall off into unbelief, but continue on in belief. Now, see, if, if that's not necessary, why does he do this? Why do they write this? Why do they say things like this? Because it is necessary. We come to church to be strengthened for just that, that we do not depart with an unbelieving heart. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Meaning we haven't got there to the end yet. We're not the end of this journey. And so while we still have the opportunity, we should be encouraging, exhorting to what? To keep on, brother. Keep on keeping on. Stay in the faith. You shouldn't come here and, and be uh, here and just go away discouraged in your faith. You ought to be encouraged in it. You know, each one of us, every single one of us, when we fellowship with somebody else, when that fellowship is over, they ought to be encouraged. You ought to, you ought to love running into a brother or a sister in the Lord. It ought to be an encouraging moment. Uh, you know, that's, that's why if you're on the job somewhere, you ought to be the best employee that everybody likes to be around. Not because you're crazy, <laughs> but because you're like Jesus. Because you're like Jesus. Some of us are crazy, and we can understand why people don't like us so much. But when we're like Jesus, think about it. All right, we got 10 people here, and uh, you, you know we've been working for a while. We've been together for a while, but we got to get rid of somebody. Now, let the only reason why they get rid of you is because they hate Jesus. But if you've been Jesus on the job, you're probably the last one they're going to get rid of. You see, that's why if you're a true Christian, just, just being the, the, the true believer, is, it can be prosperous for you. It really can be a blessing. Now, if the world turns against you, you might have to suffer. Because they're going to get rid of you because you are a believer. But better, better to do that uh, than to get rich in hiding out and being a secret Christian. Amen. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of 
sin. Why, so why do we exhort? Why do we build up? So that sin doesn't get its place. Because when sin does, you be, start to be an unbeliever. Isn't that amazing? That when you're not doing the things Christ would have you do, you start to step into the realm of unbelief. What does it say? Brothers, let's, let's get off that sin that so easily besets us. See, it's just a standard for our life that we are becoming more righteous. It's just a standard. It's, it's the way it is. We're walking with God. If we're going backwards, we're stepping into unbelief. Yeah, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Watch this. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ. Isn't that good? We have become partakers of Christ. That is a positive statement to the affirmative. Why is that? Because Jesus made a promise to us. He said, I am faithful to my promise. There's only one problem. We also have to be faithful to ours. We had a wedding here yesterday. And it wasn't that one of them was faithful and the other was unfaithful. The wedding happened because both were faithful to each other. So when it says we have become partakers of Christ. How's that going to happen if we don't have a wedding day? Let's get back to the to the body that we don't have. Jesus appeared in that room with a body that we don't have. It can't die anymore. It can go through walls. It's not limited by time or space. It's not going to get sick. It's not going to age. He had this new body, right? Well, how can he have a wedding day with us? He can. Until when? Until we're changed to look like him. Because you can't marry something that's not like you. Correct? You, you get married within your own kind. And until we are resurrected, we can't have a wedding day. And so the promise is about partaking of what Christ has, which is that new body, which is the, his father gave him a throne. He's going to give us a throne. When? On the wedding day. When's, when are we going to rule like he rules? On the wedding day. When are we going to get a scepter? On the wedding day. When are we going to live in his house? On the wedding day. When are we going to get a white horse? On the wedding day. Could get a white horse like his on the wedding day. And so we have become partakers of Christ. It's talking about the wedding day. Watch. If. Oh, we don't like the if. Yeah. I think that if means I actually got to do something. Yeah, it's called faithfulness. He's not going to tell you all the glorious things and all the. He's only going to say one thing to you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord or enter into your wedding day <laughs> for we have become partakers if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end meaning when we first said yes to him that we are faithful until the end you see, because that's the true believers. You want to know who are the saved? The Bible says who the saved are. It says those who endure until the end. That's the saved. Well, pastor, when people say a prayer here, you say that uh, they can say in faith that they're saved. Yeah. Well, in the prayer, it says that I'll follow after you all the days of my life. Isn't that what the prayer is? I follow after you all the days of my life. And that person can at the beginning begin to confess the future. Those that begin and do not finish, why are they going to confess? You know, I was, I was on the road and I heard a preacher. And if I, if I said the name, a lot of you would know the name. But I was listening to it on CD. And it so penetrated me that I remember the place where I was and when I heard it. And every time I go by there, I remember when the preacher said this and his statement was, you know what? If you have, re if you received the Lord sometime in your life, it doesn't even matter if you become an atheist, you're going to be good because you can't change what happened at your beginning. And I'm telling you, I couldn't tell you how many scriptures just rang off in my head that didn't agree with what I just heard. 
No more than this one. How can you? You are a partaker, and we, and we brag about it, man. Somebody loved me, and I'll tell people about it. And because they love me, I'm loving him. And in this faithfulness, we're going to have a wedding day <laughs> where we're going to confess one another, you know. But to have somebody say, oh, no, you could start with that, but you don't have to end with that. You can end saying they're not even there. You can end confessing that you don't even believe he's even there and everything's going to be good. Remember when Jesus said, if you don't confess me here on earth, I won't confess you before my father. What was he talking about? Well, we had a wedding day here yesterday. And you know what the bride and groom did? They stood here and they held hands. And they made confession toward one another based on their faithfulness. They pledged their self to one another and that they would be one forever. Now, if one of them had not been that, I don't think they'd ever had a wedding day, right? And here's what Jesus is saying. He's, it's still wedding talk when he says it. He said, if you won't confess me here, if you won't be faithful to me here, then why do you think I'm going to confess you on that day? Why do you think we're going to have this confession day and you're going to have a wedding? If you won't confess me here. And let me tell you, if a brother or a sister gets to a place where they say, I don't even believe in God anymore. I'm, I'm an atheist. Don't tell them they're okay. Tell them they're on dangerous ground. Tell them they need to come back to what they knew. Why on earth do we have to exhort each one daily? Lest we get an evil heart of unbelief. If it doesn't make any difference. Come on church. It is, it's why Thomas, Jesus loved him enough to jerk him out of his unbelief. Don't get stuck in things like that. Don't let self get in the way. P push on with God. Step into believing. Follow after me. Follow after me. For if we have become... Uh, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. If you know the Lord, don't harden your heart. All right. Then uh, Thomas goes on in verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him. Now, Jesus has said, stop being unbelieving and become believing. And, G and Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Here's what I believe the scene is. Jesus appears, offers it. Here's my hands. Here's my feet. Here's my side. And Thomas, stop being unbelieving, but believing. And I don't think Thomas did anything except maybe fall to the ground. I don't think he ever went over to put his hands in there. I don't think he ever thrust his hand into the side. I think he went right down to the ground and said, my Lord and my God. I think he was primed and ready, really. I, 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 he was trying to hang on, but he couldn't. And Jesus reminding him of his words eight days before. And I think he was melted. He was ready to give everything to God. Just like he was willing to die for him, now he's willing to give everything. I think he fell on his knees and he became the first person to call Jesus in the scriptures God. When he said, my God, not son of God, my God. We need, a, we need a Jesus moment. <laughs> if some of you, while, while I've been talking, if you said, I've, I've been in a place of unbelieving. I've, been in a, I've done stuff that I do it because nobody's watching. And I should know there's never nobody watching. Jesus said on that day, every word that comes out of your mouth will be judged. Every word. And, or pointless word, every idle word. Are going to be judged. That's how important it is. And that's how well he knows you. And if while we've been preaching, you've said, Lord, in some ways I've been in an unbelieving heart. Uh, Brother Ed, I was, we were talking to you last week and you mentioned somebody who said, if 
I don't know who the quote was, but now that I see you here, I could give the quote the right credit. You said that, that a brother said, if, if nothing has happened to you in your walk this week, maybe you ought to check out your relationship. Who, who was that? Okay. <laughs> you, you, were, you were going through a study thing or something. So, But anyway, but did I say it accurately? Anyway, if, if nothing has happened to you this week, maybe you need to check out your relationship with God. Because why is that? Because if we are pursuing him, we should start having days just like him. And, 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 you know, events should be happening for us just like it happened to him. You know, we've got to come out of our unbelief and get into belief. And when we get into belief, things start happening. And you may be saying, well, nothing's happening in my life. I come to church here, but nothing's happening. Well, maybe you're not pursuing right. Maybe unbelief is there. And maybe you just need that experience with Jesus to shake it out of you. Maybe your heart needs to say, instead of resisting the Holy Spirit, that you say, Holy Spirit, come on in. Amen. Instead of saying, well, I don't want him to have control because I'll lose control. No, lose control to him. And uh, verse 29, and Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. How about that? You know, we, we've heard the word. We didn't have to see Jesus. We heard the word. God pricked our heart. He said, more blessed are we than Thomas. More blessed are we. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son, or Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John says all, all four of those gospels were written that you could hear these stories, that you would have enough of a, of a witness. And you know, it was also John that said, if everything was written that he had done, there wouldn't be enough libraries in the world to be able to hold everything that he did. It, it's, it's hard to imagine. But with Jesus, it happened all the time. Every day was an event. And that's why, that's why our brother said, if something, if you don't even have a story after a whole week, if you don't have a story, maybe you need to check your relationship. Because how was it with Jesus? It was like event after event after event. Life change, encouragement, somebody change the direction, somebody giving their heart to God, some miracle. It was like event after event after event. And then he says, the things I do, you shall do also. Each one of us, when our life is coming to a close, we ought to have a big book. Not of how we made money, but of how God moved in our life. We ought to have a big book. Of, of what happened. Each one of us. And some of you are going, oh my dear, uh, that'll never happen. It'll never happen if you don't believe it. It'll never happen if you stay unbelieving with God. But if your God is real and alive, there will be things that start happening in your life that becomes part of your story, that becomes part of your witness. For they overcame by the blood of the lamb. Help me. They overcame by the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony. Well, how am I going to get a testimony, Pastor Rick? And they love not their life until the end. That's how you do it. If it's about you, don't worry about it. You're not going to have much to say. But if it's about him, then you will overcome. By the blood of the lamb, by the word of your testimony, and the fact that you love not your life. Until the end. You loved him. You loved his life. If you want to experience those things. If you want a book to be written. Then stop making it about you. Start making it about him. Amen. All right. And then we're going to end with these few scriptures. First John 
Chapter 5, verse 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is where? In his Son. That's why the question is, who are you living for? Are you living for you or are you living for your son? Are you living to build up your kingdom here or are you living for his kingdom there? And, and you will experience one or the other. If you're building up your kingdom and not living for that kingdom, you will lose everything. You're not taking it with you. But everything done in Christ goes with you. Amen. Amen. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Life. Then 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 says this, verse 16, For we did not follow uh, cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter is saying, we saw it. We were there. We saw the things of God to prove that he was who he said he was, let alone the, the resurrection and, and, you know, the death and resurrection. He's saying we saw things while we walked around with him for three and a half years. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I will please talk about at the baptism when the, when the voice said it. Also at another place it was said and they thought it thundered everywhere. So he said we've heard this from the, <laughs> the glory itself from the Father. And verse 18, and we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. That was the time of the transfiguration. And they heard the voice. This is my son. Listen to him. Hear ye him. Above everything else, hear Jesus. My brother and sister, above everything else, hear Jesus. Above everything else, put him first place. Above everything else, make sure you're not serving yourself. Make sure you're serving him. Amen. And then the last one is 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus was with the Father in the beginning. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, meaning God himself had come to the earth and they saw him. They saw him in his fleshly body, which... We have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So they were there with him. They were there uh, uh, to tell this story. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested to us. Jesus came, was manifested to us. And we're giving you this witness. Why? So that you will step and know that he is resurrected and that you will come out of being an unbeliever into being a believer. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, then maybe God has already spoken to you by his spirit and opened up your eyes to be able to receive that today. If you are Christ, but yet you have found yourself more like a Thomas, that in ways of life you become an unbeliever. You don't even expect to have God use you these next seven days, let alone that it would be natural and normal. Then you have become an unbeliever on the path that Christ has for you. What am I saying? He says, become more like me. Be conformed to my will. The things I did, you will do also. If you have no expectancy that God will use you this week, then you have a chunk of unbelief working in you. I expect to have a good seven days. Do you expect, you know, I, I, why, why is I do it? Because I want you to think about it. That's why I say we have seven days. Think about it, church. Don't waste your seven days. And listen, if you got some unbelief in there, you'll waste all seven days. Because you sit there saying, he's not going to do it with me. Why not be believing? Well, what happens then? Well, now you know he's going to do it with you. Now he's going to use you, just like he's going to use your brothers and sisters. Just like you encourage them to not go into unbelief, but to be believers. And when we are believers, we become a powerful force for the Lord. And listen, the world's going the wrong way, amen? What does it need, true believers? People actually believe that God makes a difference because they showed up. 
I don't know how you are. I believe God makes a difference when I show up. Not because I'm prideful of me. I boast of him. You know, I, I go places that I know I can't do it. And then I go anyway saying, thank you, Lord. If, if I'm the guy, then I have to go. And if I go, he'll be faithful. He says, don't worry. If you're supposed to go, I'll give you the words. It's amazing when we walk with him, all the things that can start happening. So let's not be unbelieving, church. Let's be believing. Jesus offers to you his hands, his feet, his side. He offers you to know that he is truly real. And then he just makes that, that one teaching lesson to Thomas. Now stop, stop being unbelieving and become believing. Amen. Why don't you stand? Amen. And there may be somebody here right now that your eyes were open. Only God can do that. The spirit is here. He knows your heart. He knows your knees. He knows your longing. And if he's opened your eyes to his reality, he will make a difference. You must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. That makes all the difference in the world. Once you believe that he's here, then you can surrender to him. You can receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. You can become that one that says, okay, Jesus, it's not about me anymore. It's about you being Lord of my life. It's about me being thankful that you are my Savior. And in that place, we can now have a life-changing event. We can start seeing what we've never seen before. We can start walking in ways that we've never walked before. And, you know, I just had a birthday. I went from 60 to 61. Uh, I was trying to hang on to the 50s, but when the zero starts having numbers, it's all over. But I gave my heart as a young teenager and this walk with God is still getting better. What on earth can you have, have offered to you that will do that? That can still be exciting after all these years. Now listen, religion, I was bored of religion by the time I was 20. I was tired of that. Had God not been in my life in power, I would have died in religion. I would have become like a lot of other believers said, I don't believe this stuff. I'd have stopped going to church and my heart would have hardened. But Jesus was in here and walking with him has made all the difference in the world. And so if God's opened up your eyes, this can be your moment. This can be your beginning, beginning of something that 20, 40, 60 years from now, you can still say it's getting sweeter every day. So if that's you, brother, sister, I'll lead you in a prayer of committing your heart, your life, everything to the Lord. But you have to be bold. Confess Christ and say, it's me. I, I have this need of a Savior and, and I know it today. And I want to say this prayer of giving everything over to God. If that's you, brother, sister, be bold. Raise that hand and we'll say this prayer with you. Anybody in the room that needs that prayer, raise your hand up high and we'll say this prayer with you. All right, I don't see any hands. I'm going to trust and believe that you have done that. All right, church, what are we going to do for the next seven days? Are you going to miss out on them? Or are you going to be walking with Christ? And you can't walk with Christ if you don't pursue Christ. You know, he, he said, you know, we don't save people. You know, somebody, I know they were excited about it. They were talking about getting saved. And they said, yeah, this is Pastor Rick. He saved me the other day. <laughs> We don't save anybody. Jesus saves us, right? What do we do? We can only follow. We can only become his disciples. We follow after him. That's our job, to pursue him, to follow after him, to learn of him, to, to gain and to grow and to be a part. Don't, don't forsake fellowship. Come into it. And listen, when I was hungry, I couldn't get enough of stuff. I was at Bible studies. I was at everything. You know, I was a teenager, but I wanted to be with the adults because the adults were talking about the good stuff. 
in our case, we got teenagers learning the good stuff. And adults are learning the good stuff. If, if your heart is hungry, then, then, then come, be a part, continue to grow, and live that life daily out there and watch what God will do. Amen? Amen. Let's give him glory, church, for the next seven days. Let's let him shine through us. Amen? Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you for the word today. And thank you for our brother Thomas and how you used him, Lord. Even in him missing it, you use that as a teaching vessel for us today. Thank you for doing that. And thank you, Lord, that his heart totally surrendered and he became a, a believing Thomas. And we rejoice in that. May we, Lord, be truly your disciples, your uh, believers, your followers, those that have surrendered to you, that we're not in charge of our lives anymore. You are. Lord, we, we already know there's so many places we restrict you. We say we won't do that. We won't commit to this. We, we won't yield in that. The flesh already has too many places in us, Lord. Help us to surrender those places to you. May we truly be more conformed to you when we get back here in seven days than we are today. To your honor and to your glory, in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen.